Hey, the Mad Hermit here, and in this episode of Code of the Avatar, I want to take a high-level look at game objects and components. Game objects are important to understand in Unity scene building because every item you drag and drop into a Unity scene is in fact a game object. In the scene we're currently looking at, we have no less than six game objects represented. We have a lich statue, we have this wall, we have one two point lights, a first person controller, and we have this ground plane. If I select this wall and we take a look at the inspector on the right, you'll notice this dizzying array of components. And the goal of this video is to demystify this whole inspector so that you kind of understand what's going on here and what it all means. So let's start with a more basic example. I'm going to bring in a empty game object by selecting game object create empty and we're going to drag that into the scene and if we look at the inspector we'll see it's pretty simple it has just one component and it's the transform component in fact all game objects have the transform component by default because the transform component describes the game objects position in your 3d world if I hit the E key and I select the uh, rotation gizmo, you'll see that the rotation property in the transform shows the current rotation of the game object. And then if I hit R and I adjust the scale, it'll show me the scale. So all game objects have that. In fact, I'm going to touch the wall here and we'll see that it also has a transform component. And if I slide it to the left or to the right, you'll see that I'm changing the Y axis property. All right, I'm gonna delete my game object that I just created. And we're gonna get a little more of a uh, advanced game object. We're gonna pull in a cube, not too complicated, but just something with a little more stuff to it. And you can see a simple cube, if we look at the, at the inspector, again, has the transform component, but it also has a few other components in here. So let's take a look at them. Let's start with the box collider component. Collider components essentially describe the bounding area of your game object that should be tangible. Let me make this window a little bigger to see what we mean. I'm gonna run the scene and we're gonna walk into this and notice what I can pretty much bump into it. I mean, it's like a, it has a physical presence in the scene. And that's because of the box collider. If I turn off the box collider and we run the scene, now my box is intangible and I can pretty much go through it. It's essentially giving me the power of desolification. The box collider component has a couple other properties that you can modify. Uh, you can modify the position of the collider. So for instance, if I change uh, the X position to five and I run the scene, I can walk through my uh, cube, but if I march off in this direction, you'll notice that I, I hit an invisible barrier and that's because I moved that box collider off to the left as you can see in this scene view. Additionally, you can change the size of your collider. So if I change this to a 10, you'll see my box collider you know, spans left and right, and I could run the scene, and now there's an invisible barrier. Of course, you expect a barrier here where you can see uh, the rendered cube, but not over here so that would be a little strange like a force field maybe aside from just you know providing this uh, this tactile barrier type uh, feeling to your objects colliders also register events when two objects with colliders collide when they come in contact with each other they'll both get a message saying hey you just bumped into something and through scripting, you can actually do something with that. You can modify you know, the, the behavior of your object, perhaps. Maybe you want it to blow up or disappear. 
Uh, all that can be done through scripting. You'll notice the box collider also has an is trigger variable or parameter that you can toggle on and off. And if we run the scene when the uh, box collider is set to is trigger, you'll notice that once again it's intangible. And that's specifically for, you know, creating events. Maybe someone walks through a doorway or a passage and you want to do something, trigger an action or an activity or something, uh, launch a particle effect. Uh, this will detect the collision and it will um, send a message to both colliders and uh, one of the precursors or one of the requirements for this is that at least one of the objects has a rigid body attached and we'll talk about that uh, a little later. Okay, it's later, so let's take a look at this rigid body that I speak of. I'm going to raise this box up, we're going to run scene, and we're going to notice something odd, and that is, why is this box floating in midair? And that is because it doesn't have something called a rigid body component attached. If you look here, there's a box collider, a mesh renderer, but there's no rigid body. So let's fix that. Let's add a rigid body component. There's many ways to do this. We'll go over here to add component, go to physics, and select rigid body. And when we do that, you'll see we have this rigid body component in the inspector for this object. And it has things like mass and drag and angular drag and use gravity and is kinematic and all sorts of wonderful uh, properties. But what does that mean to us? Well, now you'll see when I run scene that the uh, cube uh, fell to the ground. You know, physics forces uh, are in play and can pull this to the ground and it'll behave that way. I uh, also added a little script to my first person controller so that I can shoot out balls just so you can have an idea of what that means, see? So there you go. The balls that I'm shooting, they respond uh, to, to forces and the cube, when I hit it, you'll see it kind of rolls around and bounces around on impact, which is something that's happening again because the rigid body component is on it. And you can tweak all sorts of parameters for the rigid body component. Uh, I'm not going to get into them because I think I'm getting along in this video, but you can look them up. Uh, you can change the mass and the drag and all that good stuff so that you can, uh, you know, slow things down or make it behave uh, like there's less gravity or more gravity on a particular object. All right, let's try to wrap this thing up uh, and talk about uh, the last thing, which is the mesh renderer. Let's see if you can figure out what the mesh renderer does. Again, I have the cube item selected or the cube object. I'm going to turn off the mesh renderer and you're going to see it goes invisible. So let's run the scene again, Oop, I'm looking down, and it's gone, you don't see it, but because it has a collider, I just missed it, missed it by that much, there it is, I'm colliding into the, um, the object. So the object's there, but it's invisible, like it drank an invisibility potion, right? And so it's physically there, but you just don't see it. And so we can surmise that the mesh render is responsible for for lack of a better word, rendering or displaying an object. And there's two components to it. There's this uh, a mesh filter that uh, when you drag a mesh renderer into your scene, the mesh filter will also come. And the mesh filter, which you cannot disable, whoops, um, is, is essentially the, uh, think of it as a coloring book and, um, you know, it, it, color by numbers, if you will. So it has the outline of what you want to draw. Uh, and the mesh renderer component of that um, has uh, things like what's called materials, which you know are colors and the way light impacts a um, you know that particular portion of the image. A better example is let me look at the wall here, and you'll see that uh, again. This has something called a port room wall straight mesh filter, which means that the, and again this was re this was created in a, in a 3D uh, program, not in Unity. And so you import that in there, and essentially this is the, the wire mesh outline of the wall. Uh, if we look at the wall, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, you'll see that it has, you know, like overhangs, and it's got this uh, column and stuff, and it's not just a, a flat, um, you know, like, like the cube, it's not just a flat surface. And if we look at, so that's the, that's the mesh filter, if we look at the render, you'll see that it says it's got five materials. 
Uh, and those five materials are the different elements of this wall. Uh, and that's what I meant by saying that the mesh filter was like a color by numbers because depending on what you put in a certain positions um, is going to determine what gets changed in here. For instance, right now it says here that element uh, zero is the port dungeon trim two. Well, let's click this little thing here and change it to something else. Uh, I'm going to just say flowstone. And you see that the top kind of changed a bit. Um, actually, maybe it's a little more obvious if I say none. I'm going to say none. And when you don't have a material that's supposed to go in a you know a specific spot, if you don't color in that area of the mesh filter, Unity lets you know this by you know giving you this god awful fluorescent pink um, color, and you can see here that it says there's no material there. Well, the same thing with the wall. So the wall portion, or let's do the column, maybe this thing. So let's look for the column or the pillar it's called here. I'm going to change that to none. And as you can see, that disappears. And I can go in here and I can pick other materials that have been created. And I don't know, I'm going to put dungeon floor. So that's a dungeon floor material. And let's go over here and change that material. And I don't know, dull wood rough, whatever that is. And let's go back to our scene and see how that impacted things. So I've actually changed kind of the way it looks a bit. So the top now is like a wood, which is interesting. And this was some dungeon floor um, material. So I've actually changed how it looks because I've colored it in with different materials. And again, this was supposed to be an overview video and I've gone long in my uh, description, but Let's just quickly um, summarize everything that we learned here. And that is, and let's get rid of this guy, bye-bye. And let's just play with our wall, or eh, let's play with this guy. So our lit statue, it has, now when you look at this, you shouldn't be so confused, right? You have, it always has a transform, every object has a transform. Uh, everything, you know, if, if you want it to be visible in your scene, you need to render it. So you're gonna add a mesh renderer. Um, the mesh renderer, works in conjunction with a mesh filter so when you pull in a mesh renderer uh, you're gonna have a mesh filter that you're gonna have to associate uh, and it should be associated already it's part of the export process in the 3D program that you created the um, object in and that this filter is gonna dictate how many materials uh, are represented uh, so in this case there's a portlet statue and at element position zero and element one is uh, port dungeon trim two which is probably the, the the pedestal is what I'm guessing so again if I turn that off it disappears if I run my scene we don't see it okay back to my scene view turn on the mesh renderer the collider again is responsible for uh, you know the ability to bump into things if I turn off the co collider then I'll be able to walk through this component or this object okay and if I turn it back on then obviously we'll be able to collide into it and because there's no physics I'm sorry there's no rigid body attached if I do this and run my scene well that's odd right that's gonna look weird and actually let me see if I lift it up a little bit just to make sure that the floor is not holding it so you go that would that would be very odd right uh, a tilted uh, statue that's not falling over and we can fix that if we want it to fall over by adding a rigid body. So let's do that. Add component. I'll show you a different way to do it. Uh, go to component and go to physics, rigid body, and the rigid body components here. I don't really even have to do anything. I'll play it. And actually it just fell through the floor. So let's try to understand why the lich statue fell through the floor. The first suspect would be, is the collider enabled? And I'm looking at the mesh collider here, and we can see that it is enabled. So that's not the problem. So why did it fall through? Well, if we click on the floor, we'll notice that the floor is also made up of a mesh collider. And one of the things about mesh colliders is two mesh colliders cannot collide unless one of them has the convex property enabled. So I'm going to do that here with the um, lit statue. And as you can see, now we can actually see our mesh collider bounding box. And I'm going to run the scene again. And as you can see now, it behaves as though gravity 
uh, is affecting it. This wasn't an issue for our cannonball. I'm going to drag our cannonball into the scene. And you're going to see that that is a sphere collider, not a mesh collider. Um, and it doesn't even have that convex property. So even though there are, you know, colliders all inherit from the same uh, parent class, different colliders have different properties and behaviors, slightly at least. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. I think we've covered a lot of material. If you have questions or comments, of course, as always, leave them below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time.